we're very pleased to have David Alakubi and Kibum Kim with us today. Um, I'm Paula Ely. We are the Photographic Arts Council. Um, we also have with us today Bailey Mizell. She is PAC's brand new director. And um, so I'm glad to have her here with us today as well. Some of you had the opportunity to meet her on, on Friday and you'll be seeing more of her in the, in the coming weeks. Um, we are going to just do a quick introduction and then Bailey and I will, will disappear for a bit and David and Kibum will chat and then she and I will come back around 345 and we can help to facilitate a Q&A. So have your questions ready. Um, I want to give a quick thank you for Le to Leslie Rubinoff, our esteemed board member for arranging this talk. Um, thank you again to our members for your ongoing support. We were really happy to see and hear from many of you last week. Uh, we haven't been able to be together in person, but it was great to see some faces and hear, hear your thoughts. So we'll keep you posted on further developments. If you are new to PAC, please uh, visit our website, sign up for our newsletter, our mailing list, and follow us on Instagram. You see the info there. Um, okay, so quick introduction. David Alakugi was born and raised in Los Angeles. He graduated from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and received his MFA from Yale University in 2015. His multidisciplinary art practice is centered around photography and investigates and questions the dialectical relationships between politics, race, gender, media, and power. Um, Alec Oogie's work has been exhibited and collected nationally and internationally, and his art has been published in numerous publications. He's represented locally by Commonwealth and Council in Koreatown. We're happy to have Kibum Kim with us today, who is a partner in uh, Commonwealth and Council. He's also a lawyer and a writer uh, interested in the intersection of art, culture, politics, law, and business. It's a great intersection, I think. So I'm looking forward to hear, uh, seeing some work and hearing from the two of you. So we will say goodbye for now and we'll see you back in, in a bit. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and take it away. Thanks guys. Um, so we're going to, hi everyone. I see some familiar names here, good to see you. Um, do you see the image? Is that shared? Are working? Great. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we're going to go through, so David will speak a bit about um, some of his past work. Uh, he's actually, you can see that he is in his studio now, um, actively working on new pieces for some exciting shows coming up. Um, uh, but to give some context, we'll go through some past work. So David, if you, and like, if you, if you just want to say next slide, I'll toggle. Oh, sure, sure. Um... Let me make sure my battery is turned on. Hold on. Um, is your image is frozen, so maybe try turning the video off for a second, and then you can kind of speak over audio. Okay. So, um, so that I made in uh, 2017 um, from a... Sorry, David, your audio is coming off really auto-tuned. Um, do you want to maybe try the other uh, the iPad? Turn that, like mute this and then try the iPad. Can you hear me? Is it working? Yeah. So, 
Sorry about that. Are you speaking? Hey guys, I think it might be uh, good to to leave the call and and come back in. Okay. David, I don't know if you can hear me, but I perhaps you can drop out and come back in. Maybe Kibum can can talk about this uh, a bit in the meantime. Uh, yeah, um, actually, so this is Thank comes you. from the first show that I worked on with David, so quite familiar with this body of work. Um, so this is kind of the, the genesis of um, David's work. And firstly, am, am, I, am I okay? Everyone can hear me fine? I'll take that as a yes. Yeah, um, you're, you're good. Great. So the pull-up series is something that David um, began in 2017. And in it, he was, firstly, I should say that um, David has been someone who kind of got into photography, but was also very passionate about music um, and particularly hip hop music and the whole culture that surrounds it. Um, and having been um, uh, growing up in Los Angeles, he was really immersed in the um, kind of youth culture and scene. Um, and something that he had been thinking about a lot is the notion of uh, respectability politics. And I think we're actually, you know, this, this summer I, we've been um, speaking about this a lot, but it's something that um, I think has been very much on the foreground of David's thoughts and experiences um, throughout his whole life. So particularly in the African American community, he felt that a lot of his elders, um, you know, particularly his own father, um, but a lot of other kinds of male figures that he respects, um, wanted him and other young black men to uh, really, you know, be kind of like Obama, you know, someone who is uh, conformed to the sort of um, respectable, educated um, kind of rhetoric and dress and mores. Um, and so when he began the series, The Pull Up, and you can kind of see here, so, um, this is the, the kind of the torso area. So the top band here is a tank top. The middle part here is uh, underwear and the bottom blue part are pants. Um, so it's really about that kind of sagging pants style that uh, um, originated in hip hop in like the late eighties, early nineties. Um, and, you know, during this time he was reading a lot of um, news articles about these kinds of local ordinances that were being passed outlawing it. Um, and, you know, these were happening across a lot of uh, southern um, townships. So in many ways, they could be read as uh, kind of like a coded regulation of black male bodies and the way they dress. Um, and around this time, speaking about on this issue, President Obama had actually said, um, I think that, that the exact quote is something like, oh, like brothers should pull their pants up. So kind of conforming to that kind of respectability polit politics rhetoric um, and thought as well. So in thinking through that, you know, David uh, um, wants to kind of question that notion and about self-expression and about uh, the, the legacy of radical expression that we see a lot of times in music, but through an, a, in, in corollary ways with the way we dress and present ourselves too. Um, Okay, I see that David is back on. Uh, can you try speaking? Okay, your sound is quite muted. Um, so we'll try again. In a very like auto-tuned way still. Can you hear me? Yeah, that sounds much better. Huh. Let me see. Yeah, so I just gave like kind of like, a, like the, sort of like the the, the um, context. Still the uh, auto tune. Uh, okay, it's working now. Yeah, I think it's working now. So I just I, ju I just kind of like gave the the, the context about. Um, you hear me? Your, your in, yeah, your interest in music okay. and how the sagging pan style was um, outlawed in a lot of townships and how that sort of informed your thoughts. So. Maybe you can um, begin by talking about your interest in exploring right, the body right, as a whole. Right. Yeah, 
Yeah, okay. So um, it first started out as an interest in exploring this. And that came from thinking about the landscape as a resource um, where that people like wanted to um, extract things from like a space that people could enter and have like different like agendas for, whether that be um, um, survival, like, like people have different um, ideas of like how they think about how landscape like functions, like how space functions. Um, and, and also like there's this uh, question of commodification, um, like how do you commodify a space? It's like really complicated to do that. And so many of like, there, there, there's so much like infrastructure like setup that we have that revolves around like commodifying spaces. And um, the, the form of capitalism that we have here in the States is like built on the commodification of, of bodies, you know? And so, I wanted to talk about that as being like akin to the way we think about um, a space. And so that's what kind of gave me the idea towards thinking about um, the body as a landscape. And also um, thinking about like this idea unknowable, but oftentimes like desired at the same time is like a really kind of well-worn, um, concept in like in landscape painting and landscape photography um this idea of the the ecstatic so that's where um all of these kind of different um ideas kind of like meet you know in terms of like how the body is commodified both um in terms of its uh ability to kind of like generate value but also like sexually you know so and, and that's where like all these like ideas meet and this kind of concept of the horizon line as being um, the belt line. So, and then, and then also thinking about um, the history of uh, modern abstraction and abstract expressionism um, and trying to enter into that conversation after the fact, um, mostly because there's like a history of excluding um, black radical expression when we talk about um, modernism uh, in, in art history, right? So um, that's where kind of all of those kind of ideas came to, to a head to, to, to make these works. And they're um, titled in a way that draws attention to them as being color fields. So that's what the letters respond to. Like K is like black, for example, white, W is like white, R is red. Um, and then that also was something I was interested in as a, a printmaker. Um, I think that a lot of what I do is printmaking as well, um, which is like a whole kind of uh, back and forth questioning about um, how marginalized people exist in the art world at large in terms of like being um, makers or craftsmen. Um, so yeah, like this idea of um, them being prints and not necessarily the photographs is, is where uh, the titling came from. And so. Um, do you wanna to speak to like what we were discussing yesterday about like new topographics and that kind oh, of right, right, right. And um, so, and in thinking about uh, landscape, urban landscape or uh, modern landscape, so I, I teach photography and um, one of my assignments or the assignment that um, I had been thinking about last year a lot was like new topographics. Like new topographics, um, so it was a um, photography exhibition. We can think of it as like, one of like the first uh, exhibitions of, of what I would call like modern landscape photography. Um, there are artists like uh, Robert Adams, Joe Deal, The Beshers, Nicholas Nixon. Um, most of it, I, I believe all of it is, is black and white uh, landscape photography, but it's 
a lot of it is urban landscape photography. So the subtitle is um, The Man Altered Landscape. And so that was also, that also felt really close to what I was doing that prior year before thinking about that um, exhibition, before thinking about that assignment, like this idea of the, the, the man altered landscape um, or, or, or the landscape that is constantly um, uh, affected or altered by that kind of external sources. So um, I wanted to, to think about how to be included in that conversation as well, um, just because as a teacher, I'm trying to find ways to prove that the assignments work in a way that's not, so the, so the fear that every like instructor has is that they're just gonna end up with a bunch of pictures that might look like the pictures that they showed in the slideshow, you know? And, and so I was trying to assign my own assignment to myself and um, figure out what I came up with. And what I often have students do in this, in this assignment is to walk around um, the city, either it's like a place that they spend a lot of time in, places where they grew up, um, various like landmarks, and think about like um, how the structures are integrated into the landscape. Um, think about how um, the architecture either mimics the landscape or um, is a part of the landscape um, to just like, like think about how the landscape has like changed over time since they, you know, been a part of that community or um, have existed in that space. Um, so that's where the idea to kind of like take a lot of these uh, previous images and re-photograph them out into the landscape and also the, the idea of re-photographing them was a way of, of testing this idea of the body as being simultaneously a space and an object, right? So you have an object and one of the things that's, that's distinctly different is the fact that like you, you move around the object, right? And um, so I wanted to kind of uh, test this idea of it being in the landscape, but also um, outside of the landscape, you know? So it's like oscillating between being in my studio and outside of my studio. So that's where the idea to kind of take the work and then like re-photograph it um, outside. And then also for me, I was really, really, for whatever reason at the time, maybe it's because I was spending a lot of time like outside, I was spending a lot of time walking around the city and the thing that to me, just spending time in like Chicago, I went to school in Chicago, in New York, and um, just spending time in all these places, the thing that it, for me stands out the most to me about Los Angeles is the light. So really I wanted to make a series of landscapes that was, about how the light was affecting these various things that I had already made. Um, so I can like have a conversation that was specifically more about light and shadow. Um, and so like, that's where, you know, for me, a lot of the um, motivation to take a single photograph and place it in different areas came from, to just like see how the, how the light affected that. Um, situation so yeah just to uh, cut in quickly yeah. here so you'll see like the series begins in 2017 with these just studio shots of the body um and creating these kinds of like color field compositions and then what david was just speaking to is this kind of like the next iterative stage of the work when it developed in 2018 and it was shown at the art gallery um uh it was the show was called uh, to live and die in la and you'll see what David's speaking to about that re-photography element where he printed the images, took them outside to various places in Los Angeles and re-photographed them, allowing for the light and the kinds of flora of LA to come into the picture. And so you'll see in that tiny little caption at the bottom of the images, the titles actually tells you um, where the images were taken. Um, do you want to speak maybe to kind of like the significance of the places that you chose? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, so the flowers or the flora um, that's like growing up and around the, the, the pictures. I was, I was thinking a lot about um, what would qualify as being native to the space, you know, um, thinking about what grows up and around, like when you're not looking or when you're there, but you're not really paying attention. So I was, I was, I was thinking about like, like people and their ability to be native, like this idea of being native to a place and thinking about like how um, the various like plants that you see um, function in that way. And then also this kind of goes back to like the, the, the previous shows, thinking about them as being kind of like um, about mourning. Um, I was thinking a lot about when people, when like say for example, like, um, you know, when someone like dies in like a shooting, oftentimes people will like leave flowers at that site because um, maybe there's not the resources to honor that person in a different way. So it's almost like they become like a part of the, like, the space again. They're like reintegrated into like the space again. Um, and that's where like the idea of like the flora came from. And um, so the locations, a lot of like the locations are like places that I like grew up, um, places that were like really significant to me, like Florence and Normandy. I don't know if you guys know, it's like the flashpoint of the LA riots. Um, there's like a Chevron there, there's like a liquor store on one uh, corner, and there's a um, uh, owl zone on the other corner. And there was a truck driver who was like driving down Florence and like, somebody like threw a brick and um, pulled him out of his car. And that's like what kind of started the LA riots, you know. Of course, you know, because of the, um, the, the Rodney King verdict. And then from there, um, that's where like that started. And that was maybe uh, three quarters of a mile down the street from like where my mom grew up as well. You know, and then there's um, Cedar Sinai, where like Tupac passed away. Um, there's all of these, uh, which is you know, Cedar Sinai is, is, is where my um, my aunt used to work, and she used to tell me like the story about like treating Tupac, you know, in the hospital. And um, yeah, there's like one location like where I like went to high school. There's another where I got like hit by a car. Um, so there's really, all these like like locations that were really memorable to me and that like um i wanted to kind of talk about as like a like a narrative of the space and not so much like how it looked but like how it felt and so yeah these yeah. are like the first pictures that i made kind of testing testing this idea um this is like um, a concert concert image yeah, and the Cedar Sinai um, images are the only ones where the where the actual the body picture are ones that David did not take. So those are images of Tupac, who I think we can say is like one of the kind of celebrities who popularized the sagging pants style. Um, but obviously, kind of like a hero in hip hop for uh, many reasons, um, including yeah. David has spoken about sort of like the vulnerability that he brought to their music. It wasn't all just about swagger, um, but he really brought mm -hmm. kind of like more of a soulful, um, vulnerable nature to rap. Um, and you can kind of see in these images, so all of these are artist frames. Um, David plays around a lot with the kind of printing. You know, he's spoken about how print he considers himself a printmaker as well. So he's printed different images on satin, watercolor paper, canvas, kind of based on how he feels it best interacts with the content. Um, and the materiality and objecthood of the photo print is very important to him. Um, and that might be a good seg actually to speak about how the work kind of developed and the interest with uh, fabric and sewing the African-American quilting tradition that led to the flag series. Right, 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 right. Um, so ever since, so I, I started out um, 
in graduate school, just like going, going all the way back. It's, it's really, really being invested in the history of documentary photography. Um, I still consider a part of what I do as documentary photography, but um, in graduate school, I became like really, really interested in crafts um, and the history of crafts and um, in arts and how um, there's oftentimes like this hierarchy that is like placed on um, uh, how someone like thinks through the mark making, you know? And I wanted to uh, talk about like these forms of mark making that were m more closely like related to um, work or um, family or uh, like, like this idea of sewing to me like like it's like a it's like a suture you know it's like this this form of mark making that is oftentimes always um, attached to two broken pieces that are coming together you know and so that's what that's one of the reasons why um like this idea of craft has always been interesting to me because one you know, you, you have like this kind of like pre-existing like material and then like you're like a, like a new narrative. So it's almost like, like you're never quite, you never quite like have, have access to um, uh, something that, that feels uh, less in, indebted to your, your, your obligation to, um, um how would i how would i put it it's 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 hard to to explain it's like um like the difference between um being a cook and being like a chef like the idea of like being a chef is is like like putting putting all of this kind of like poetics around what is essentially like like work you know and i wanted my my i wanted the pictures that i made to be in conversation with um, the idea of like craft, you know? And for me, um, thinking about like probably like, like the person who influenced me the most to be like an artist was like my sister and she's like an amazing like seamstress. And um, like she was one of the first people that I saw doing like a creative lifestyle that felt um, completely like her own. You know, um, because like I, I come from, you know, a family of people that really more values um, um, like white collar work or like, you know, being like hyper educated, like my dad is, is, is Nigerian, you know, and I, I feel like I was I was brought up in this way that um, you can you should always be thinking about um, ways to to make your work less like physical or less like work, you know. And um, she was one of the first people that I saw that was an artist in her own right that was also like um just like making a, a a life for herself you know because like i don't think that without her i would have believed that people could be artists you know and and so yeah i i think like that's where the um the root of this kind of quote making sewing motivation come came from it's also like um this this fascination with fashion's capability or fashion's like potential to allow marginalized people to express themselves. So, and that goes back to like the idea of the, the landscapes. Um, I think that I've been thinking about this for a while. Um, 
I think that our culture is like what we export as like Americans, you know, that's like the thing that like we make that people care about, you know, and like, I don't, I don't think it's like ridiculous to, to assume that African American culture plays like a large role in like what that is, however, like fraught our, our relationship to, to African American culture and our version of like capitalism that is that is born from like chattel slavery. Um, you know, it's for me, it comes from the fashion, it comes from this idea of um, the kind of hierarchies of like valid art making, you know? Um, it comes from, uh, yeah, the kind of well-worn history or tradition, you know, in the, in, in the African-American community. Um, yeah, I, I guess it's, it's so many things. Um, it just seems like my relationship with independent, like high achieving, black business people are oftentimes craftspeople. I'm just gonna like say that. There, there are people who started their businesses in hair salons. There are people that like started their businesses, you know, like working, you know what I mean? And I, I think that there's this other side of it that's like, make sure um, you also pursue like a college education and all this stuff. But like, this is a really like old like debate that, that comes all the way from like Reconstruction from like Booker T. Washington, W. B. Du Bois, but it's like a, a whole kind of conversation that you can kind of get into when it comes to, to why I'm interested in, in craft. No, so. and I think it also relates to the kind of mind-body dichotomy that has framed so much of kind of Western ways of thinking and um, it also aligns with kind of racialized hierarchization. Um, so, you know, it's like when there were all these like sort of spurious scientific studies to say like white people are inherently like smarter and have like bigger brain. Right. I was just say it's like, well, you know, they are smarter. They, 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 they live better lives of the mind and like darker folks are um, mm -hmm. like better laborers. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's about, it's right. about bodily, bodily work mm -hmm. and craft being kind of um, put down and to mm -hmm. also to mm -hmm. rationalize the kind of subjugation in that way. But with this body work, I also just want to kind of all flag, no pun intended, but right. yeah. uh, David yeah. was also thinking about the flag because with these sorts of um, mm -hmm. high colored compositions, they kind of um, also signal how flags are oftentimes these sorts of, I mean, literally coded symbolic kinds of images that carry a lot of meaning. And so trying to sort of like redefine that with the sorts of traditions and meanings and for, for the people that he's familiar with. Um, in the interest of time, maybe we should um, speak briefly to the kind of like the newest body of work. So, so and everything that we're gonna talk about from here on out are kinds of works in progress, um, not necessarily fully resolved, but um, you can kind of see this is the final image and maybe if you want to move the camera around and show us what's happening in the studio um, and then let's open up. The sure, sure, sure. Um, so uh, I went to Nigeria for the first time last summer um, as kind of like a research expedition, I'll call it. Um, okay. And primarily, like, what I was interested in was um, the textile production there. Um, and one of the things that really stood out to me was how important the fabrics were for, like, these kind of different, like, really expressive fabrics for, like, everyday people. They're, like, portrait fabrics. People make uh, custom fabrics. Um, a lot of people have uh, uh, custom tailoring made, and it it really came honestly like there's this there's this book, is this this book? Can you see it? Oh no, you can't see that. We can see it. So there's like a book. It's a photographer, um, Sudu Kaita, or Seydu Kaita, and um, 
there's a various various African photographers historically, but um, I had been looking at a lot of those pictures, and then there's like another book over there that I had been looking at. Um, I kind of discovered African photography in, in graduate school, but um, one of the things that I, I noticed was the fact that the textiles, the fabric, was almost like a it's it was a character in the in the photographs, right? So like. There were the people in the photographs, but the, the, the textiles were, were telling a complete story. And I, I felt like there was an opportunity there to, to talk about that, to just talk about the textiles. So, and just because of like, like the, the resolution of the image, like this is like a textile that's like made from other pictures. It's a textile that's made from textiles. It's a textile that's made from other pictures. So it's also, um, trying to like unite like this really um, historic idea of uh, uh, African-American quilt making or sort of like mixing these like textiles together, kind of like trace the, these like lineages all the, all the, as, as far as I could, you know? And um, so I started like in, in, the, in this series of photographs, for example, there's, um, these landscapes, you know, that are forming like this, like pattern, you know, um, and then also um, I'm taking like what I learned from the last show about light and shadow and trying to like apply that to this, to this new work, right? You know, so the idea of like the, the drapery itself, kind of like forming the compositions, you know, um, depending on how like the same uh, textile is like hung, you have like a completely different um, set of uh, abstract forms. Um, and so like, that's like something that I had been like, really like interested just, you know, um, as a, as a image maker, you know, it, it felt like there was like, uh, a lot of potential to talk about um, really kind of um, specific questions about photography, you know, in this situation of the, 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 the textile as like a, as like a type of drapery, you know, um, so. Yeah, and this is a and this is kind of like a, as I mentioned, yeah. like in progress. Yeah. So the idea is and to place them in these sorts of mm -hmm. um, custom plexi boxes, so it won't be um, wood. Right. So right. Um, yeah. continue to experiment with the sort of kind of um, object hood of the works as well. And yeah. mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think we should probably, you know, we have quite a few questions that we should get to. So maybe we should open oh, it yeah, up. Sure. Sure. But, I like, um, I like questions. Questions are cool. Yeah. Questions are cool. So, hi, everybody. Back. Bailey and I will come back and help to navigate this. Thank you. And thank you all for your patience with our connectivity and audio challenges. You know, we're all at the mercy of our internet suppliers these days. So, ah. making it work. We're making it work. So, thanks for hanging, for hanging in there. Really interesting. Thank you so much, David and Kubo. This is really great. Um, Bailey, what do you have a, we have a number of questions. We do. We begin? Um, so this one might have been answered a little early on, but it's from Nate Paluga. And he said, is there a genre of black photography? And if so, how do you describe it? Um, I don't think that there's a genre of black photography. I don't think that black photography has been historicized enough and that's my main beef in graduate school it's almost like um i spent the time that i was supposed to be like making like re-educating myself you know i i think that um there's the kind of form of perpetual like re-education that is just you know implicit in these kind of like in, anytime you 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 talk about like genres or, or anything kind of in, uh, attached to institutions, um, you kind of have to like, like ask yourself whether or not um, it's been like written enough about 
and honestly, like that's like the work that I, I'm supposed to be doing. That's you know. So if like the work hasn't been historicized, or if it hasn't been talked about enough, it's not being like taught enough, you know. Then like that's like what I'm supposed to be doing. But um, yeah, I don't I don't think that it's a genre. I definitely think that. Um, uh, and Amiri Baraka talks about this, um, radical black expression is a genre, um, but it spans like all these different like disciplines from like poetry. I feel like the biggest are of course like poetry and jazz, but um, I don't think that photography is at this moment, I don't think that black photography is, is a genre. And so. Right. Um, go ahead, Bailey. Um, that was actually a pretty solid response there, David, uh, and I can echo that as well. Um, the second question is Evans Ward. So the photograph becomes an object as well as the product. Yes, 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 definitely. I think it's interesting to use the, the, the term product. Um, we lost you mainly because a uh, product is like a commodity and that's another that's another thing like the oh it's, it's not working it's working you hear me um that was another thing that uh was interesting to me about um craft um was this idea uh that the thing that was for sale was the thing that was for sale you know and i wanted to to question that because could the thing itself be the art and the, and the idea be the art at the same time? And that's the reason why um, we have to have an entire like exhibition about like these quilts that, you know, feel a lot like, you know, um, minimalist modernist paintings from like this. If you, if you look at them, they're in like dialogue with all these like things, you know, but because they like fill a need as like a thing and not as like an idea, um, they're like products. I, I think that that's like a, it's, it's this, again, this messed up kind of like hierarchy, you know, of value of the things that like people do, <laughs> you know? So yeah, but um, the product, the product, that's an interesting, that's an interesting way to think about a photograph, you know, uh, especially because I'm always, I'm always thinking about it as being like a replacement for the thing that I'm photographing, like something that's like, uh, maybe not like a replacement for the thing, but it's like, it, it owes enough to it for it to uh, at least uh, want to fill that role, like, like, for example, if I take a picture of like a sculpture that I have over here, the picture has to be good enough for people to maybe, you know, it, it, it has to, it, owes, it, 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 it has to do a job at least, you know, it's like how I, how I think about a, a picture, you know, usually. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and just to add that a little answer. bit, um, I think David's work, as you can kind of see, uh, definitely has a dialogue with um, advertising and consumer culture and the kinds of imagery mm -hmm. that we encounter through yeah. it as well. So yeah. thinking about the kind of seductive mm -hmm. power of that and how it ties into these different kinds of social, uh, capitalist machinery, and particularly how from Black culture, how, mm -hmm. you know, things have been kind of co-opted and right, filtered yeah. out through so, you know, like the sagging pants style, for instance, you know, it was, mm -hmm. it was like reviled when black men were doing it. But then when Justin Bieber does it, it's like a, whatever it is. <laughs> right, um, right. Yeah, the yeah. There's this, who's the, who's the comedian? There's a comedian, there's a comedian that talks about, I forget his name. Right. Yeah seeing the appropriation of black visual culture um, so um, our third question is from Nate Luga again and he's saying what camera lenses do you use 
Interesting. Oh, these are the nerd, the nerd questions. Okay. Um, well, let me see. There's, there's this one. It's a studio question. I use a lot of different cameras. Um, so there's this one. And this is a Fuji non. Uh, 135 W. Um, so I use a lot of different cameras. Um, I think about cameras like they're like instruments or something. And uh... um, okay, while well, David's moving. <laughs> I like this one. This is one I use a lot. This is Zeiss, uh, 50 millimeter. Um, <laughs> okay, maybe maybe we can um, consider some art, uh, other questions as well in the interest of time. Can you but share the news that you guys received. Yeah, so um, one thing I'd like to mention, you can kind of see from David's studio, you see the, the sort of like African masks um, in the background. So that is going to become part of the newer body of work too. So particularly in these times, David's been thinking through how um, a lot of these artifacts have ended up in various kinds of institutions. Um, and sorry, mm -hmm. one second. I am on multiple Zooms right now. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the, some of the some of the images that you saw from past work and um, uh, newer work will be part of MoMA's new photography, which was just announced earlier today. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, it will be an online edition this year, but it will debut, um, I believe, later in September. Congratulations! Very big deal. Thank you. Very big deal. Yeah. Um, we have another question uh, about your, what informs your use of particle board framing? Hmm. Um, so there's all these different materials that I use and I like the particle board. It's not particle board. It looks like particle board. It's um, oriented strand board and it's a building material. And um, the use of the building materials uh, for me, it came from thinking about um, provisional forms of architecture. Right. Um, and that, uh, honestly, so there's like another, there's another book, um, an African photographer. Uh, let me see. Uh, so one of the things that like you, you that was really like interesting to me about um, being in Lagos was all the different forms of like provisional like architecture, like the way that people like cover their walls, like the way that textiles are, are used as like wall coverings. Um, so I was thinking a lot about uh, architecture. Um, as well as uh, the fact that visually, um, I thought it looked like grass. Um, so it, it had this kind of like, when I, when I uh, tinted it green, cause like um, I had been making a lot of like silver gelatin prints that were hand toned um, because like back in the day, like before color photography, used to like have to like tone all of the uh, the prints if you wanted them to be color. So I had been um, thinking about that and thinking about the, the strand board as like a kind of photograph that I can like tone, you know? And um, that's where that came from. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? actually a pretty brilliant insight. Um, should we continue with questions? How are we on time? You have, we have a couple minutes. We can do a couple more, I think. Okay. Um, this question is from Gary Freeman. Um, actually, I don't know if this is, yeah. Certain colors seem to recur in these images. Do they have particular meanings in what you want to represent in your images? 
as far as the colors. Mm -hmm. um, so I have like this really complicated like relationship with, um, with the color. Uh, I feel like um, I always want the color to be attached to something that uh, I always want it to be like descriptive. And I think like for that reason, I was like working in monochrome for a very long time. And the first kind of like experiments that I had in color were two things. I started making like a lot of cyanotypes and um, I was also like uh, making these prints with like Nike boxes. Um, so I was like allowing the materials to kind of dictate the color palette. And um, as well for me, the biggest kind of like colors in my work is often like blue. And like for me, like there's this, all this like writing that I was doing about like the color blue, it's like history with, you know, blue note and jazz. And, um, and also I had like a, a exhibition of, of blue work that was titled The Thin Blue Line. There's like a documentary by Errol Morris, like about like the police line. Um, so yeah, like the blue is like a really significant color, like the red, um, uh, red, white, and blue is oftentimes like a color palette that I use a lot, like because of like the flag. A lot of like the flag work was like, um, like one of my professors at school, he had like an entire exhibition that he curated about Jasper Johns. So I was like thinking a lot about Jasper Johns. There's a, there's a few works that are tar titled Target. And um, yeah, there's like the red and the white, the blue, the green, of course. It's like a Pan-African green usually. Um, yeah, um, some of the colors come from, like there's this, uh, uh, let me see if I can show you, like, um, there's this one, I think, you see it? No, there's that one. One of my, uh, the people that uh, I met, you know, when I was in Africa, there's these uh, like checkered uh, textiles that people wear um, called shikas. And uh, this is like, that was like the exact one that like, he got, and then he took me to like, go like find like another one. And um, that's like where the Shikas came from. It's um, the Maasai tribes people is the Shikas, which might like look like familiar as like a, a Burberry thing or like uh, it became like the Shuka fabric became super popular in the fashion world, like maybe like a couple years ago. Um, but yeah, Kenyan stuff. Some effusive uh, comments here. Um, Caesar says uh, these are remarkable. He really likes the To Live or Die in LA series. He says you've transcended the postmodern in a poetic and meaningful way, somehow making a photo feel ephemeral. Um, and uh, our good friend Claire, um, you said you, you mentioned earlier about the relation to print but she sees um, a relationship to painting as well. you have any thoughts about mm, Definitely, 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 definitely. Um, so uh, the relationship with painting, right. Um, so I think that uh, there's like a relationship between like painting and photography that it, for me, really, complicated and uh, it's just it's a it's a frustrating thing to talk about because of course like we can like talk about it in like this really like academic way you know but um, I definitely think that like like there's like types of painters like there's there's types of photographers and I think that I like 
I'm like in like multiple like camps, you know? And I think that, um, so photography in general, photographers have a less mark making. Um, I think that because of that, there's like, um, a chip on their shoulder or something, you know? And I think that, so there's that, there's that. That's like a thing that I don't think like, like people like talk about in public, you know? Um, this kind of like, I can like do that type of thing, you know? Um, there's a really good like Paul Graham like essay that he did for like, I think like 2009, like Yale catalog that like talks about like photography is hard, photography is easy. And um, that's another reason why, why like, I picked photography because photography for me is hot because people think that they can do it, but then it's like, um, it's easy, but it's also hard, which makes it, for me, very exciting. I am like the person who's like the super photo like nerd that like, I, I can just talk about like cameras all day, right? You know, and printmaking and like the super nuances of like, the ink set and the printer and like how to calibrate it. And it's gonna be like, but like, I have an iPhone, you know what I mean? And I think that that's frustrating, but it's also like super, super, super exciting because it's like democratizing in that way, you know, like, and I really like envy people who kind of, not everybody, I don't blow up, I, I don't envy everybody who like blows up on, on social media, but um, I definitely, think that it's interesting that you can have a thing that you don't need a lot of access and information to really make it pop, to really have your voice be expressed, you know? Whereas like with painting, it's like you kind of like need some training or more training. And I don't know, I'm, I'm, telling, I'm telling too much business, too much business, you know? But um, but yeah, I have a I have a lot of I have a lot of uh, opinions about the hierarchies of like image making crafts. Um, but yeah, everything is good. Everything is good over here. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's after four, so I think we should leave it there. Thank you so much for coming and, and sharing your work with us today. This has been really extraordinary yeah. and it's been great to get to know more about, about what you're doing. Yeah, this is, this is fun. <laughs> <laughs>